Following Christ comes with a cost, but it's worth it. Father, we thank you for the time that we come to share in your word this week. I pray that it will make us be alive in you, whatever the cost that we will face this world, knowing that you are on our side and victory is on our side. And we look forward to that day when we share with you eternity. Help us to pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Join me as we read Acts chapter 12, verses 1 to 5. During this same time, King Herod began to, to do harm to some of those who were part of the church. He ordered James, the brother of John, to be killed with a sword. Herod saw that many of the Jews liked this. So he decided to arrest Peter too. This happened during the festival of the unleavened bread. He arrested Peter and put him in jail where he was guarded by a group of 16 soldiers. Herod planned to bring Peter before the people, but he wanted to wait until the after until after the Passover feast festival. So Peter was kept in jail, but the church was constantly praying to God for him. Persecution of the Christians is revived again in Jerusalem, according to this text. That even the apostles were not spared this time around, being the center of focus. We see that James was killed and Peter was thrown into prison. Now the tyrant leading to the violent assault of the church is Herod Agrippa I. About the time when the church in Antioch prepared to send a, re a, re a relief offering to the brethren who lived in Judea, King Herod Agrippa I launches his violent assault, launches his harm to the church. The name Herod is not an easy name to get along with. This name is attributed to a notorious reign for attacking the people of God. Agrippa, the first grandmother, was responsible for slaughtering the babies after the Magi's visit. Herod Antipas, the young son of Herod the Great, an uncle of Herod Agrippa I, beheaded John the Baptist. And now we read in Acts 12, Herod Agrippa I, killing James and throwing Peter in jail. Christians from age to age will face all kinds of opposition if, seeking, if they are seeking to advance the gospel. But one thing that you and I, a believer, should know or should uh, take hold of is that as we face this kind of uh, challenge or this kind of conflicts or oppositions, we know that we have this unshakable assurance that in Christ we have victory and we are more than conquerors. So don't be discouraged or dismayed because following Christ comes with a cost, but it is worth it. So the church in Jerusalem is actually getting more troubles and believers are getting more troubles because of Agrippa the first. He was part of the Jewish, but also we see, we read about the history of this Herod Agrippa the first, that he had been appointed by the Romans to rule over most part of Palestine, including the territories of Galilee, Perea, Judea, and Samaria. He persecuted the Christians in order to please the Jewish leaders who opposed them and hoping that this would solidify his position in power. Herod was known as a political chame chameleon. When with the Romans, he lived in a Roman fashion. When around the Jews, he lived for their favor. He was a people pleaser, a glory seeker. 
and a Christ hater. Herod Agrippa uses a unique approach, different from the one we see uh, in uh, Acts 8 and Acts, Acts 7 and 8 uh, of souls going house to house, uh, hunting down the followers of Christ. He instead opts to put death the church leaders, consequently destroying the morale of the church. And he starts with James, the son of Zebedee the brother of John. James, along with John and Peter, who is later thrown in prison, were a member of the innermost circle of Jesus. So Her Herod kills James, who is a significant leader, with a sword, which may imply beheading, but also this causes threats to the church and the followers of Christ. James and John, again, were two of Jesus' disciples. We recall them engaging with Jesus, and then they asked Jesus for special recognition in his kingdom. When you read Mark 10, 35 through to 40. Now, Jesus had said to them earlier that to be part of his kingdom, they one would must suffer with him or drink of the same cup. So James and John indeed suffer because James is executed and later John is exiled when you read Romans 1 9. Herod's decision for killing James pleased the Jews and because he did it he went ahead and decided to arrest Peter. There wasn't any reason to arrest Peter or kill James because these were known political revolutionaries. But Herod just wanted to play the Romans and the Jews. And in so doing, he wanted to assure the Romans that this so-called Christianity movement isn't violating the ways of Rome. And he wanted to appeal to the Jewish community by showing that he is standing up for their traditions. That is to say the temple, the law of Moses that they followed, and their separation from the Gentile community. Herod Agrippa I loves power. He's a glory seeker. And he loves to please people. We don't have to look far to find modern examples of persecution for the Christians today. You see that evil one is always attacking the church. But this should give us hope and assurance that actually we are on the right track and we should stay strong and have this unfavoring assurance that in Christ we find victory and in him we are more than conquerors. Now, one thing that stood in the way of killing Peter was the Passover celebration. It was for the Jews' annual celebration of the Exodus when God freed his people from the Egyptian tyranny. During this same time, neither trials nor carrying out sentences for those accused was permitted. So Herod sends Peter to prison guarded by a group of 16 soldiers. That's a lot of soldiers for one guy, suggesting that perhaps the Sanhedrin had informed Herod Agrippa of the previous jailbreak recorded in Acts chapter 5, verse 19. Herod's intention is to bring Peter out to the people for a short trial following the Passover celebration. No doubt, Herod thought this would carry great feather with the Jews and bring him much public glory. Remember, he's a glory seeker and he's a people pleaser, but a Christ hater. Pay, pay, pay close attention to this. That when Herod attacks with a sword, the church counters with prayer, as we read in verses 5. 
Now this should always be the church's response during times of great trial and opposition and agony. Herod's plan undoubtedly was to execute Peter, but the believers were praying for Peter's safety. The earnest prayers of the church significantly affected the outcome of these events. Prayer changes things. So pray often with confidence. What do we learn from this text for our times of living today? Number one, you and I, every Christian, should embrace opposition with a cheerful heart. The cost of serving the Lord comes with a price, but it's worth it. God's people have always faced persecution in all corners of life. We shouldn't be surprised when we face opposition while on the mission ground. We should be surprised, actually, when we don't. Jesus tells his disciples, you will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. While Jesus told the honest truth, he also reminded us of the greatest truth. That yes, we're going to face persecution and suffering, but in him we are more than conquerors. So let us embrace opposition with a cheerful heart. Number two, always remember, God is in control and he is sovereign. Nothing catches God by surprise. He works in mysterious ways. One would think, why would God allow James to die and Peter to live? We aren't told all the reasons. Sometimes God answers prayers for healings, and sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes the wicked prosper while the righteous suffer. While such trials bring so much grief and pain, we must not be angry with God. Trials are not necessarily a sign that God is displeased with us. God calls us to trust him. Even when life hurts, he's always, his ways are good, wise and just. And we must remember this profound truth. God has given us his son. God does not promise to give us an explanation to everything that we go through in life. But he has given us the promise that changes everything. He will raise us from the dead. We will dwell with him in the new heaven and new earth where sin and suffering can't be felt or touched. Through Christ, God has entered into our suffering. He has taken the ultimate injustice at the cross and has risen triumphantly so that all who call out to him may have eternal life. Keep hold of this truth. Because glory is coming. Keep looking to God in faith. He gave his son for the sinners like us. And soon this suffering will end. Lastly, let prayer be always your first response while facing any kind of opposition. One would wonder about the church's response while facing opposition. Why take up arms? Why not, why not take up arms? Why not protest? While force and outcry are appropriate at times, prayer is always the first and the best response. In the words of John Piper, prayer is a wartime walkie-talkie. The church is at war. So they call up the commander who shuts the lion's mouth, humiliates pharaohs, breaks chains and opens prison doors, knowing he will act in whatever way he knows best. How do you regard prayer? Learn from the church in Jerusalem. The kingdom of darkness uses physical weapons. The church uses the weapon of prayer. Weld your weapon. God bless you.